Thank you all for being here. Can everyone hear me okay? I can't really see you, but okay. I'll take that as a yes. Um, thank you uh, to John and Dustin for being a part of this panel, to Kelly Carmena for encouraging and uh, organizing this event, and to all of you for attending, to Matthew doing the sound uh, and lighting over here, um, and yeah, especially to everyone for attending this uh, Amanda, you said, you know, you described the spirit of PRS so well, and these books, these anthologies, um, are in the same spirit. They're really for everybody, whether you're a Manly Hall fanatic, or you're myth-curious, or whatever you are. Um, so, <laughs> um, I have a bunch of notes that I'm going to really kind of try not to look at, um, and just open it up to discussion between these two brilliant um, friends and colleagues. I will say a few things up front just to describe the project since this is sort of a belated celebration for these books. Um, they were published during a time when we could not be together, um, and now we are. So this is in a way like a little, a little launch party. Um, I was asked to be scholar in residence, I think, in 2019, and shortly thereafter, um, part of my responsibilities in that role um, and otherwise was to take on this gigantic project of um, creating new anthologies of Manly Hall's work. And if you know anything about him, he is myth-level prolific. Um, and I am still nowhere close to being an expert on his work. But I began by really looking at his images. These covers uh, were eventually designed by artist David Orr, who is the first artist in residence here and a great friend of PRS. Um, originally, I was looking into doing designs as well, and what that did for me is that it got me looking at all these images that Manly Hall has put together over the years um, and the real aesthetic kind of feel of his imagination um, behind his work and his words. So that stuck with me, and Dustin seems to think that it got into the organization of the chapters, which I felt like was my most creative curatorial work, was finding like a flow. It, it was a journey. I felt <laughs> like, uh, you know, I, I feel like choosing the first chapter, chapter is crucial and starting with muses yeah, as this, a... just starting with inspiration and mm -hmm. things coming down. And to me, it was, a, it was a circular journey and each chapter a metamorphosis from one architect to the other. And at the end, you know, in book two, it ends with Buddha being showered by the seven dragons, or how many dragons? I don't remember how many dragons. It might be at seven or ten, but, you know, <laughs> just being showered by the, the celestial and cosmic mm -hmm. energies, and it felt, it was great. It was a great experience. <laughs> well, I'm just, I was just really glad to hear that earlier, because then it sort of worked out. And I didn't really even realize it came to that sort of cyclical conclusion in an image. Um, but yeah, beginning with the muses, I did want to sort of state that up front. That was very intentional, and I want that to be sort of invoked in our panel tonight to just talk about what uh, muses or amuses us about these books. Um, but yeah, it was it really felt like a curatorial project. Um, I scoured the database of PRS journals, which is available to anyone else to look at, if, um, and read and reread everything to do with myth. Um, Manley Hall's titles don't always indicate where he's going in his uh, articles, so you really have to read them all and see if they, you know, what they're really about, and they're about a million things. So any, pretty much everything made the cut, which is why there are two volumes. Um, but wherever it was determined that this piece is really more about a religion specifically, or this is really more about art or folklore. Um, those decisions are just lines of demarcation between future anthology themes. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful for that. Um, and what else did I want to say about the process? We learned a lot. It's printed by the PRS uh, imprint, which is also a nice 
you know, it's it's on demand printing at this point in history, but it to me is still a nice thread of the legacy of PRS being uh, an in-house bindery and such a, a publication um, machine for so long. So it's still in that lineage to me. Um, I am writing introductions for these volumes. They're not in the current volume, um, but they will be in future printings. Um, I think that's all I have to say about how <laughs> the books came into being. But what uh, we wanted to do was just talk a bit about our favorite chapters and images. Um, I'll be saying a few things about a chapter called The Strange Creatures of Mythology um, in volume one. And I asked Dustin if we could continue projecting his strange creatures of mythology up here, which is what I consider these things to be, and he agreed. So um, I will also just tell you a bit about, I think it would be good to just read through the list of chapters so that you know what's available. Um, the first volume starts with the muses, then there's a chapter on blue Krishna, all about the blueness of Krishna. There's chapters on Athena. Kuan Yin is a really beautiful chapter. Um, Navajo sand paintings, the ring of the Nibelung. Uh, there's a chapter in the second volume called The Gold of the Nibelung that's amazing that ends all on this um, point about the uh, importance of responding to climate change. And I think he wrote this in who knows when. Um, the Mystery of a Feathered Serpent. Uh, there's some really lovely little sweet chapters called Recreations in Hell and um, When the Devil Went to Work for God. And these are, these kind of show Manly Hall's humor. Um, so there's a really nice variety of chapters um, for people to enjoy. And what do you think? Well. <laughs> I have to begin tonight just by saying my heart is so full to look out and see this many people in Los Angeles that could be doing anything came out to have a conversation about mythology and, and philosophy and the deeper experiences of the human journey. So right now, uh, I'm, I'm just sort of sitting here in my own elation. Um, but after I get past that elation, what I'd love to say is I think we, we have to take a second and pause and be thankful for the fact that um, there are physical books still being <laughs> created and that the, these ideas uh, have, have been manifested into physical books in an era that we live in where so much of our experiences as, as human beings is being captured in the digital space, of which I'm a great fan. I'm, I'm, I'm very fascinated by technology, but I hope we never get away from the physical objects, those artifacts that continue to make us human, of which I would suggest that physical books are one. And so my initial response is, is, is to say thank you for making sure not only these ideas came forth, but they came forth uh, in something that I can see and touch and, and smell as I open uh, the, 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 the fresh book uh, smell. Everybody know the fresh book smell when you crack the spine of a fresh book? It's the best. So that's, that's my initial uh opening shot over the bow, if you will, is, is deep gratitude, the fact that we have these artifacts of culture that we can talk about, but that we can hold them in our hand. Definitely. Uh, yeah, thank you for appreciating that um, and for picking that up with such enthusiasm when I just volleyed it on that you. <laughs> in a moment I'm not quite knowing what to say, but um, that, that makes me also think about, like, how could it not be that way with this sort of library that's on this campus that if you haven't been to it, anyone uh, in the audience, you must visit. Um, John and I went through the same PhD program in mythology, and I never knew about Manly Hall. You might have, I know you did, 
Um, but he wasn't somebody whose name came up, even though he had this vast body of work that's just completely related. And I think a lot of that is that he doesn't really offer a lot of citations. So he's a problem for academia. Um, and it wasn't really my work to fact check him or anything like that, but what I kept thinking about was, well, he has one big bibliography, which is that library that was used. Um, so, he, you know, he has rare books, he has a whole publication history as a library, so to be able to add physical uh, pages to that legacy is really um, an honor. Yeah. I, I think we easily can move past uh, the, the fact because we have books in such um, such volume nowadays. It's easy for us to forget that for a long period of human history, books in and of themselves were sacred, regardless of what was in them. Mm -hmm. And the idea that a, a book is a creation, it, it's, it's a piece of art in and of itself. That, I think, is, is something that um, uh, we have to bring into this discussion of mythology, is, is in a sense, the book is a piece of mythology in and of itself, just the physical creation of the book. The other thing that a book is, is it's a time travel device. Yeah. I'm allowing uh, Manly Palmer Hall to whisper his thoughts into my ear and as I can hear his voice as I read these words and these pages, and, and in doing that, he, he lives on in the physical mm -hmm. form. And, and that's, I, I think of significance to our discussion about mythology tonight is, you know, for the thousands of years that mythology was simply um, brought through the oral tradition, you know, it was passed down just through the words that people spoke and what a, a tremendous uh, advance in humanity for us to be able to take those words and to capture them somehow. And all the positive and negative effects that had, that had on human memory and all, all of those things come into this uh, discussion, but just to have a, a, a book that captures these ideas, it, it feels like a, a proper place to begin any discussion. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that a lot. I couldn't help but think of it as its own strange creature of mythology, uh, this composite myth um, in itself. And um, and he in that in that chapter on strange creatures of mythology, he has so many great examples. He talks about minotaurs and Pegasus and um, dragons and unicorns and all the, all the favorites, um, but he also talks about language as a strange creature and um, masks as a strange, a way to be a strange creature. Um, there's another author, Carl Perenier, a mythologist who writes about when you put on a mask, um, you're able to make another being present in this world without leaving this world. And I think maybe books can act similarly or art as well. Um, he also talks about civilization as a strange creature. Um, he talks about his interpretation of a centaur, the man body on top of a horse body, is, uh, you know, his sort of grand imagination is, is humankind emerging out of the animal world. And then that to him is a segue into, well, the human is really the strangest creature, um, which made me think about how the human is also this, uh, I, I really love thinking about shapeshifters and metamorphosis, and um, as I get older, I feel how I change form <laughs> and uh, am becoming this shapeshifter and this, this strange creature, this, this person who's still a little kid, but also a, a full, you know, grown person. And, um, so there's all kinds of examples of, of that. Yeah, did that make you spark something for you, Justin? Well, I'm, I mean, I feel like any archetype has a beginning, middle, and end. Yeah, and lots of middle. Yeah, the middle's the, you know, the peak, <laughs> you know, peak archetype. And, yeah, but and then, then repeat. Yeah, then there's always some tragic thing that happens to mm -hmm. this. 
heroes or archetypes. Mm -hmm. I often think about Jason and the Argonauts, oh. and I'm yeah. getting crushed by the actual ship that he. Right. I don't know, kind of this washed up, washed out kind of situation. And isn't the ship itself uh, so often repaired that it. it yeah, that's, yeah that's it's, Theseus, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Theseus. Um, <laughs> that it so often has pieces replaced that it's, it is and is not the same. Um, so that to me just speaks, one of how, you know, whatever attracts people to mythology, it's so different for everybody. Um, for Manly Hall, it, it was a lot about how to relate to really big principles, I think, and really big platonic abstract ideas, which he was so fascinated by and found to be connected everywhere, but he um, he has this line about, you know, we, we need to relate to those in some way, and we know that we're relating to things like that when we feel what he calls a stirring of analogy, which I, I love so much, and I think that is the moment, and that can happen with anything. Um, so I'll just sort of say what I think about the Strange Creatures chapter since it keeps coming up, but um, what I find powerful about those weird monsters and those composite beings is that it's kind of emblematic of myth in general. Um, I, I still hear myths all the time that don't affect me at all um, because it's just sort of not like that. It, it's about suddenly there is a relationship where you might not expect it or if you spend a little time with something you'll find it. Um, but they show us that I think a myth can be anything. It can be any combination of things. Um, like a griffin creature is sort of a, like a vision of what poetry is. It's all these different things put together and, and suddenly they're a relatable unit. And Dustin, your work does that for me too. We were talking before this event about how like when you're a kid, you can just spend time looking at a crack in the floor and then there's a whole cosmos to it, and you've sure. got people living I mean, there, and like it's... Yeah, children playing with yeah. toys, you know, you're playing with your guys, and <laughs> it doesn't matter, any toy can interact with anything, and, right. and yeah. all the themes are there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I remember playing with my toys, and we're playing with elements, there's betrayal, there's somehow this entity is the same as this entity, and they're switching places. Mm -hmm. All the plot holes are there, but all the you know yeah. concepts are there, and those are potential mythologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anything that sort of impresses a sense of meaning or importance or wonder, and you know, clearly over time, they they there are certain archetypal formulations yeah. um, that last, and they're strange, they're odd. They're, I, I have been teaching mythology the past year, and some students struggle because it, they don't know how to relate to it. Mm -hmm. And um, my take is sort of like, well, don't worry about it, it'll happen when it happens, and then you'll see why any of these things are, are potentially um, effective in a meaningful way for people. Um, Dustin, I, that made me remember, you were talking about abstract yeah, visions yeah. and myths. Well, I mean, it's, I, my, my love for mythology is kind of finding the abstraction in the narrative and the narrative in the abstraction. And that's kind of how, how I find my creative flow. And, you know, I, I like to traverse this space where I'm, it's input and output. And a lot of artists like conductors or disc jockeys, painters, you know, who can observe and experience and apply at the same time. Um, I, I feel like, uh, you know, different mythic moments like Perseus killing Medusa and out of Medusa's neck, the blood becoming Pegasus or the Japanese god. Izanagi cutting the fire god and the blood becoming gods. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that's like Jackson Pollock painting or uh, a Mark Rothko painting of, you know, it's like his paintings at Rothko Chapel, they're mostly black, and it's like the formless darkness. And, mm -hmm. um, and the Jackson Pollock paintings are potential mythologies once you start having this relationship with a different 
uh, shapes and patterns and becomes these potential archetypes mm -hmm. for potential mythologies in your in these kind of personal reflections. And, um, that's why I like them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think finding those occasions of really of existential truths in, yeah, whether it's the image of Medusa having her head cut off or, or a Rothko, they're sort of as mysterious and mm -hmm. somehow can feel the same. I, I just find that so fascinating. I'm not much of a storyteller. I'm more into images. You're much more of a storyteller. Um, and I know that you were um, taken with the Dragon Lore chapter, which is actually the closing chapter of the second volume. Yeah. Uh, do you want to tell us a bit about I, why? You know, um, I, I feel like dragons have been coming up quite a bit for me this last year in a variety of different contexts. Um, and, and it began, um, it began about 18 months ago. Uh, I was invited to uh, do some consulting on a television show that is coming out later this year on HBO that happens to involve dragons. Some of you may, may not know what I'm talking about there. Um, and the more I began to think about dragons, I, I, I'm loving uh, what, what Dustin's saying about art because my process in thinking about dragons in many ways sort of mirrors that, that creative artistic uh, uh, process. And, and as I began to, to look into to dragons, I really wish I had had this book actually before I began to, uh, to look into them because um, it really uh, helped solidify a lot of the, uh, the things that I, I had found. But I think it's important to realize that up until uh, the 16th century, dragons were brought into books of natural history uh, on a regular basis. That the dragon was not uh, assumed to just be a, a creature of the human imagination up through the 16th century. Books, you know, that featured animals would often feature uh, dragons right alongside the other, you know, animals. Um, the uh, Chinese zodiac features the dragon, and it's the only supernatural being in the entire zodiac. Which, which again, rise, raises the question, you know, um, maybe human beings uh, had experiences that we. Uh, we're unaware of that, you know, were these creatures uh, real? But even if they were not, there seemed to be something so archetypal, something so universal in the human imagination when it came to dragons that um, we, we find these both in Eastern mythologies as well as Western mythologies. This is something, by the way, uh, this is in mythology too, I um, highly recommend you pick up these books, by the way. The, the chapter uh, about dragon lore that Manly P. Hall goes through, he outlines some of the differences between Western mythology and Eastern mythology when it comes to dragons. And one of the, the, the key pieces he points out in the chapter that I think is, um, is very relevant is the idea that the, the Western dragon uh, was associated with evil almost from the very beginning uh, because of early church father influence. Uh, dragons were connected to uh, early alchemy movements and they were symbols that um, uh, of, of, of nations and others that early church fathers uh, saw as being uh, problematic to the work that they were trying to do where the Eastern dragon uh, has always been much more nuanced. It's always been much more complex. Um, it, 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 there's been a number of theories about uh, how the, the, the same idea of the dragon rose in both the Eastern culture and the Western culture. And I'll, I'll give you just two brief ideas that uh, Manley Hall brings to play. One is that um, it really connects, Devin, with what you were talking about earlier, about these composite ideas of mythological creatures often being composites of different animals. And in various parts of the world, 
reptiles uh, were, were dangerous. Uh, and, and there's been a, a fear of serpents for a long time in humanity. And uh, the word dragon uh, literally translates to serpent, which makes us sometimes wonder in early ancient texts, you know, are they referring to snakes or are they referring to some uh, dragon type creature that, uh, that we may have lost the context for? Well, the idea of uh, the, the, the feathered dragon, which uh, Manley Hall writes two chapters uh, about one on dragon lore and one specifically on the feathered dragon, and you may or may not see a feathered dragon in this upcoming HBO show that I consulted on. I don't want to give anything away, but there may or may not be a feathered dragon in that show. Um, and the feathered dragon is extremely interesting because it's the composite of the creature of the ground, the serpent, and the creature of the air. And so the feathers of the creature of the air meet the scales of the creature of the ground here on earth. And this is the, the idea uh, that, that perhaps the composite of these two ideas gave us uh, these earliest <coughs> dragons. Of course, uh, we, if we look at it from a scientific point of view, we know that uh, birds are actually dinosaurs uh, of a certain, you know, sense, and so that there may have been um, in in the human muscle memory memories of encounters with creatures that no longer exist on this planet that that somehow manifest in these ideas. Last thing I'll say about dragon lore, and then I'd love to hear the, the two of you explore it with me, but. Joseph Campbell uh, explained dragon lore as being a great symbol of human greed. And the idea is that dragons is in Western, let me, let me uh, revise my statement, Western dragons being the symbol of human uh, greed, not so much Eastern dragons. Western dragons were all consumed with hoarding two things, gold and virgins neither of which they could do anything with. Uh, but the, the idea was that gold, in, in many ways, represented uh, uh, human uh, energy, human prosperity, uh, the, the vitality of life, in, in the same way uh, that, that virgins had uh, a, a similar meaning. And so the idea uh, of dragons was about uh, conserving or, or being greedy with the vitality of life um, and, and as we all know with vitality, when you, when you hold that in, when you try and put limits to that or put gates around that, it, it becomes useless. You know, vitality is only uh, useful when it's uh, allowed to be free. And so this idea of the dragon, I, I think, has been as much a, a piece of the human psyche and our psychology as it has been uh, part of our creative imagination. Um, do you have... Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there, there's such a duality with dragons, with the Western dragon and the Eastern dragon. And like you said, like in the West, it's something to be conquered, where, you know, it's like St. George. Yes. And I feel like recently, with a film like The Master, where um, mm -hmm. uh, L. Ron Hubbard is doing a sermon where he's like, I have a dragon, and I put a leash on it and I've conquered it. Of course he hasn't, you know, but throughout the film he falls so many times. But with the Eastern Dragon, it's something that we revered and it's almost inconceivable, un un not understandable, uh, uh, because it's not like a human at all. That's why it should be respected. And... Yeah, um, I was just thinking in terms of the, the myth volumes, uh, the books, I, I think that Manuel does a pretty good job of balancing appreciations of East and West, especially given the time he started writing, and, uh, and he also, did you read the Gold of the Nibelung chapter? Um, that's one of my favorite chapters, it's in, it's in the second volume, like I said, he talks a bit about the dragon in that story um, as well, so this is, you know, the Norse mythology that Wagner made his operas about, and then Tolkien takes up his thing uh, with the ring. Um, but 
but it all comes out of this mythos. And as you're saying, you know, there's something about dragons for the psyche uh, that continues to come up. Well, that it also gets, you know, uh, it's not it's not just a matter of some old outdated pagan religion. It's also the work you're doing on whatever show you're working on and. Um, the work he's putting down, the, the Wagnerian opera, they all sort of uh, serve to confirm another layer of this archetypal thing, for better and worse, um, because that's how myth is. But uh, the one thing about dragons that also stood out to me that I wondered if either of you had any thoughts about was, I think it was in the Strange Creatures chapter, um, he discusses the dragon as a sort of a, a creature that it's not real, like any of these things, but it's imaginally real, which is a reality in itself. And that um, people used to, maybe some still do, felt like they experienced the dragon uh, in nature by sort of like its effects, its weather effects, like the movement of the wind and clouds in the sky was considered to be a dragon. Um, these sort of visible invisibles uh, thing. The movement yeah. to the moon with some oh, yeah. uh, groups too. as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's so many different directions to go in. Um, uh, I was wondering, since we have your work going, um, sure. would you want to just say any more? When we were writing your introduction, or not your introduction, your exhibit description, um, we talked a lot about myth yeah. um, and how. And I think what's an important word um, that we've brought up a lot is this word relationship um, between these things. I was wondering if you, if you, you don't have to, but it might be interesting to talk about, if you were to say something about your work mythically, sure. in mythic terms, I mean, I, mean that be? I think I touched on it a little bit, yeah. but um, I mean, these, these videos and pieces are, are, were very private mm -hmm. videos. I didn't really show it was for me, my own pleasure. Yeah. I, would, I would watch it at night and go through different correlations. But um, I mean, basically, I feel like in Manly P. Hall's creation, when he's talking about creation, it's, it's always it's from a cloud of chaos or the, you know, the formless darkness. And, and then the things come out in this, this abstract way. And my attempt at you know, making these pieces, I would watch them to bring out my mythologies mm -hmm. and archetypes and through the different patterns interacting with each other, uh, what kind of narratives are occurring within me and through this interaction relationship. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I try to get that out of the stories as well yeah. you know, that I'm reading and it also feeds in to the work that I'm making. Yeah, the stories always become images. There's certain elements of stories that really sear. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I really feel like these images become stories too. They do. They, they're not plot by plot narratives, no, no. but they're, they're, they're more than static image too. So I just I find that fascinating um, with your work and that I felt like once you installed it here, uh, I got one of those those senses that it's like these these images could have always been here, and you just show them. <laughs> and, and they're all they're all circular. Yeah. You know, it's like they're on turntables, and it's rotating. And uh, and I find these stories, myth, mythologies, being these circles and archetypes being circles, and all these bend bends are happening, you know, overlaps. Mm -hmm. It's all, it's all that, you know, it's the archetypes interacting with, with, each, with each other and these kind of almost, I think we've talked about this before too, like catalysts in stories where it feels idiosyncratic but intuitive. Mm -hmm. And you described it to me as the mythic instinct. Oh, yeah. And I really, really love that where it's not logical. Right. It's, it's instinctual. Right. Things happen because of desires and, mm -hmm. um, you know, just uh, 
just human flaws or even divine flaws. Yeah, or something, it reminds me of something that this other author of mythology and archetypal psychology, James Hillman, um, talks about which uh, there's always this distinction made between mythos and logos mm. uh, in terms of types of sense making. So, logos, logic, reason, mythos, more of a sense, intuitive, uh, narrative um, type of sense making, meaning, meaningfulness. Um, but he also points out that every, every god of myth or every, you know, little detail of a myth, uh, has its own logos. It has a logic about it. So there's a Dionysian logic, there's a Hestian logic, there's a dragon logic, and then there's Eastern dragon logic, and then there's, you know, Japanese dragon logic. And it gets very, it's, it's, uh, we can talk about myth on such a gigantic wholeness level, and then you can get very, very detailed, and it still has um, a type of existential logic to it that I think is why people have those occasions of connection. Um, you know, maybe, maybe you relate to, uh, I don't know, uh, the moment of having your head cut off of <laughs> Medusa because of an emotional... Uh, resonance, um, and then you understand Medusa logic forever, um, and also the other components of that you need. And this is always these relationships too. You don't have Medusa without her head cut off, without Perseus, without her pissing off Athena in the first place, without uh, Pegasus stepping in her blood. Like all of them are being born from her blood. There's all these details that come together, and I love that too. And I, it's probably not the sort of correlation I should draw, but I feel like I read these books so many times in editing them, and I read them again for this panel, and I still can't remember so much about them. And they are, that they remind me of like a kind of religious text in a way, which I don't, I don't necessarily want to say that, but they just have that much information um, that rereading is instructive. Um, to, to discover more, so, yeah. Um, I don't know what time we're at. Should we open I know we're, it up? we're going to q and I, I had one last yeah, thing. Yeah. I, I was, I, uh, I was going to drop a surprise on the two oh. you know, see, see what, uh, see how, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I thought, you know, I've, I've been sitting here being really impacted by uh, Dustin's art and just the, the way the images are, are washing over me. Mm -hmm. I wonder if I might could share a very brief myth of a dragon yes. and have the two of you just respond to whatever comes up. Yes, I love that. Okay, let's, let's okay. try. Um, we'll let you in on it too if you'd like to listen mm -hmm. in. Uh, this is, uh, it's one of my favorite dragon stories and it comes from uh, an ancient Syriac poem uh, that is sometimes referred to as the Hymn of the Pearl. And it took place many, many thousands of years ago between space and time. And it begins with the king of the west and the mistress of the east who are raising a son who decide that it is time to give their son his inheritance. And before the son can have his inheritance, they instruct the son that he must go down to the Nile River and that he must face a dragon that is swimming around a flaming pearl of great price. So the young prince sets off on his journey. And he travels for days, weeks, months, that turn into years. But eventually, he arrives at the Nile, and he finds the dragon swimming around this pearl, with flames coming out. He sits waiting for the opportune time, just the right moment when he could dive in and snatch up the pearl from the dragon. And he waits days, weeks, months, and years. 
Eventually, in his waiting, a band of travelers came along, and they invited him to, to eat with them one night. He took them up on their offer, and they sat around the campfire, and they sang songs, and they told stories, and he had forgotten how good it was just to be with other people. The next morning, they invited him to travel with them. He had had such a good time, he decided he would travel with them for a while. So he took off with this band of travelers. And a few weeks into their journey, a group of robbers came to the travelers. And they were going to take everything they had. But the band of travelers said, you know, we have this man who's just joined us. Why don't you take him instead? So the band of robbers took the man and they sold him into slavery in Egypt. The man's days were filled with making bricks of mud, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, he made bricks. Through space and time, his mother and his father saw what had become of him, that he had forgotten who he was, that he had forgotten he was this prince, he had forgotten what he had been sent to do. And they sent a raven that landed on his bed one night who turned into a parchment. He picked the parchment up and he read this letter from his parents that reminded him who he was, what he had been sent to do. That very night, he escaped his captors. He returned back to the Nile. He swiped up the pearl from the dragon, not waiting for the opportune time any longer. And he took weeks, months, and years to return home and receive his inheritance. That's, That's beautiful. beautiful. Mm -hmm. I love that. I mean, the coming and going, that, that movement in, in stories like Orpheus and Eurydice, Ishtar, even Izanagi and Izanami, that there's a transformation that happens, and at times redemption, at times not. I, I love how that ended, you know? <laughs> um, sometimes it ends so tragically. Um, yeah, I also love that play of time, passing and the urgencies along the way. Um, but they're both equal amounts of time somehow, meaningfully. Um, it made me think about the uses a little bit because I was thinking about memory. You know, what is um, what is the importance of memory in this story? I'm not, you know, we could, we could interpret it however, but um, the muses are nine daughters of the goddess memory and, um, and Zeus and there's lots of ways to interpret Zeus, but one, since he has so many children, uh, is that he's this creative imagination of many possibilities. And so for him to create children with the goddess of memory, uh, you know, you, you do, I don't, I'd like to like keep myth and math separate, but you do some kind of sense-making between that. So, um, but memory is a titan which means in the genealogy of, of that mythos, memory precedes even this creative imagination or this you know, desire to seize or, or whatever you might take as the Zeusian aspect of his mission. Um, but memory brings him back. And the same um, author I mentioned before, Perenye, has a piece about how the goddess memory and the goddess forgetting, Lethe, are actually at the origin the same thing because sometimes you need to forget in terms of letting go for what's important to enter again and that in itself is a sort of opportunity for inspiration once we're not seizing on, on memory so I don't know it seems like there's plays of when things are able to catch his attention and mm. sense of urgency and um, the dragon just keeps that sounds so cosmic, like a pulsar yeah. out of a star. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's why mythology is, um, it, it is so important, regardless of uh, what, what culture we come from, what you know, age we are. 
mythology continues to expand and open itself up to give us new layers um, every time we hear even the same story over and over again. And that's why I think these books are so important is that um, it, it is, is Manly Hall is, is writing uh, about these different, you know, stories uh, that, that we may or may not know. As it was writing about dragons, this story came back for me. Mm. And it, it caused me to think, what, what part of myself has forgotten who I am? Okay. What part yeah. of myself has, has forgotten what I'm here to do? Mm -hmm. What part of myself needs to stop waiting for the opportune time to, to run in and snatch the pearl from the dragon. Because mm -hmm. it's still going to take forever to get it back. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's amazingly easy to forget about those Reading things. Reading these books, the chapters, it really rekindled. Oh, I'm so happy for that. Yeah, love for all these things. Yeah, it deepened mine too. It's not... Um, Especially this this particular reading. Um, there's another chapter in the second volume on the thread of Ariadne that I think is really beautiful. Um, and I'm not going to say more about it in terms of the dragon story because I think that ended well. But it reminded me a bit of needing a thread, not to just go in but to come back out. That's what the thread is.